Welcome to Senior Living Marketing Perspectives. I'm Debbie Howard, co-founder of Senior Living Smart. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Alex Fisher, co-founder of Sherpa CRM. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, Debbie. Such a pleasure to, to be with you today. Yeah, glad to have you on. And I have to say the the timing of this podcast is so interesting. And we'll just give the listeners a little bit of context because it'll be um, published uh, in a few weeks. But Alex and I today are sitting here first week of June. Um, and so we're still, you know, deep in the uh, the COVID world and trying to reimagine uh, what, what things look like from a, a sales perspective. Today, we're really speaking more on the sales side than the marketing side. Um, but I think even more important because marketing has to align with sales much longer into the sales process um, than we ever did before. So it's, it's an interesting time, uh, but, it's, but particularly interesting because um, Sherpa has just released their um, data insights from um, March, April, and May. So really looking at the impact of COVID. Um, and I, I found it to be really interesting. Um, and so I just, I would love for you to kind of frame for the audience uh, about the, the report and um, then we'll get into some of the key findings. Sure, sure, thanks. Yeah, it was a, a, a real um, team effort uh, to put together this data. We at uh, Sherpa have a tremendous amount of data, very rich. Um, we keep track of things uh, that all CRMs keep track of, but in addition to that, uh, we are able to provide uh, more of a qualitative indication of the, the sales and outcomes and the duration of activities and the focus on activities and what's producing outcomes, what isn't. So, so that's all falls into the realm of sales effectiveness, which is what we're really, really focused on um, trying to improve for all of us. So uh, marketing being super important, but ones that lead the prospect is served up to sales is what do we do to actually bring them to fruition? So we took, uh, we took a sample of our data. We um, didn't include all of our data because we wanted to make sure that uh, there were communities that existed uh, all through 2019. Uh, so we took a, a, a section of that data. We, it is, I believe, about 82,000 units of um, independent living, assisted living and memory care. Um, so we had a, a pretty nice wide sample of, of, of that, of the industry. And that also includes CCRCs, uh, in terms of independent living and some active adults. But in, in general, I think, um, you know, levels of care tend to be a bit of a gray area. You know, what who is an independent living versus assisted living customer? So sometimes, and most times, I think, in most cases, the way we approach the, the conversion, the sales process, um, should not necessarily be predicated on the level of care, but mostly on the person um, we usually get it wrong anyway, the level of care <laughs> until later in the process. But anyway, in any case, um, we had some really great, great insights and data. I mean, some of the obvious. Uh, I don't know if you want me to talk to. Yeah, some let's talk about kind of the, the obvious, which probably yeah. is not a big surprise. Yeah. But then, then it's like, how do you interpret that? Right. Sure. And, and sure. Wh how do you identify opportunities? And, and then what can we do um, going yeah. forward? <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, so certainly the obvious being, you know, movings are down. Um, the the good news with May was that um, there was a slight uptick in in move-ins, and that could be that uh, people are starting to different communities are starting to accept move-ins, you know, with very tight protocols. I know many of them are. I think about seventy percent of our customers are taking move-ins in a you know with protocols in place, obviously. Um, so, so that's starting back up, and so that's kind of the new good news in terms of marketing or lead, new leads, new inquiries. Uh, that's also um, we've seen an uptick in May, um, I believe nine percent increase, and and I'm sure that by the time this podcast is released, we we're, we're going to see things ramping up. Don't have the crystal ball. This is such a different new situation that we don't know. However. You know, there's there's some good news there. Um, you know, we we reported on which leads um, were the the one that ones that lead sources that declined the most, 
we didn't take a super granular view at marketing sources. That's for a different report. Um, but in general, the obvious again, uh, you know, leads generated through events are way down because uh, we obviously can't have events. Um, but and the strongest, the the lead sources that um, experienced the least amount of decline um, were lead aggregators like a place for mom, caring.com, or paid referral sources and um, website digital um, sources as well. So then, so that's kind of the marketing. Yeah, okay, so do we have enough leads? Are we gonna die because we don't have enough leads? You know, for us, we've always sort of uh, talked about um, having enough leads most of the time. And, and by that I mean, um, when we look at lead bases, we find that many of those wonderful fresh leads that are generated by all of our marketing efforts are underworked. Um, and so there's a, a very quick, in general, in the industry, how sales used to be, hopefully that's going to change. There was this sort of um, cursory, uh, somewhat shallow engagement with each one to quickly understand whether there was a, a need, what was the urgency, et cetera. But at the first sign or at the second sign of resistance, like mm, just looking or maybe later, uh, we just moved on and we sort of put the marketing pressure on more leads. These are no good. These are not ready. So that's our philosophy. Our philosophy is that people, the new lead is not going to be necessarily any better than the old lead. As a matter of fact, there's gold in your existing leads that maybe said no to you already. They said no to the tour, not yet. There's resistance. So our, our, when we delved into what are we doing now that we don't have as many new inquiries coming in and what are we doing with our sales time now that we don't have the tour or the home visit, which is a huge chunk of our selling time in the past, um, and this, this almost addiction to the tour as the only way that you could get your results. Obviously, everybody, most people uh, that make a decision to move want to see and want to see it, and they all will have a tour eventually. But that's not necessarily the best strategy uh, from the get-go. So uh, we, de we delved into now what are we doing with our sales time now that we can do that 30% of time that we found in 2019 we're, spend, we're spending face-to-face -face and running around, getting apartments ready, walking around to you know, helping move-ins, et cetera. So we find that there's a 30% decline in sales time. Two reasons for that or maybe more, but the two obvious one, the first one is we've pulled salespeople away from selling. Now that you can give tours, perhaps you can pitch in and some of the operational stuff. So heard about many of them delivering meals to residents, et cetera. And know that's understandable. However, um, in, in one of the other theories that I saw in the data could be that um, people just don't know what to do with their sales time now that they don't have tours. So, um, you know, they're not spending as much time. Um, I also saw a, a huge uptick, obviously, on call-outs. There were lots of call-outs, lot, lots of leave, leave messages. So now we're spending almost half of all of our sales time on the phone uh, trying to reach out. The conversations with prospects, the length of the conversation of, uh, compared to 2019 has not really changed, maybe a couple of minutes longer now. Um, mm -hmm. So that was notable to me because the opportunity here is to engage. Uh, what if we start measuring? What, what could we do to stay on the phone a little longer, to, to have a, a longer conversation with a prospective buyer, whether it's their family or the actual potential prospective resident? So, so there's an opportunity there to sort of hone in on our, strate on our strategy when we call. What do we say? What do we ask about? How do we get a little deeper so that we can have a longer conversation? So right there, it's like, let's go from 16 minutes on average now to maybe 20. Um, mm -hmm. Just shoot for that. And what is it that we can say and do in terms of our sales approach to uh, existing leads that will keep them engaged and, and open up a little bit more to us so that we can get to know them better. 
So that was number one. There was a, certainly tours went down from, I think around 30% of our time to about five, and then virtual tours came in the scene. And that's, we can talk about that in a second. Um, so the, the key insight is that I think that we need to ramp up our sales time, make sure that our sales teams are 100% dedicated to selling because there are things that we can do, many things in terms of cultivating, nurturing, um, expanding the quality of our interactions measured by time, measured by the way we discovered, measured by the outcomes we get from each interaction, and measured by how well we plan in advance before a salesperson picks up the phone instead of how are you doing i'm checking in which doesn't resonate very well with people mm -hmm. it's like they can read you know they can read it's like why do you really care um it's it's actually prepare for that call you know go through that contact that pr prospects profile um, figure out what it is some things that you're curious about oh my goodness i don't know anything about this aspect and then approach that person prepared um, already understanding what it is that you are going to say and what are you going to listen for. So planning and creative follow-up were the other two key things that we found obviously had increased um, as two proactive, extremely foundational um, sales activities that really boost the, your tours, your interactions with prospects. It's like sort of foundational is that strategic planning for each person before you pick up the phone or before you do anything, before you write that email, figure out what it is that you know about this person, get curious. And then secondly, after you do that planning, then you'll have a better feel for what kind of advance, what, what are you gonna ask that person to do? Are you ask, gonna ask them permission to maybe send some important material that may be relevant to them? Are you, are you gonna ask them permission to contact their mom uh, or their brother or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Are you going to be able to engage in a human, authentic way in which they will disclose to you one of those things that they've been hiding uh, and then you'll have a much better insight. So opportunity to increase, still further increase creative follow-up and planning as sales activities, spend more time there a little longer planning sessions, a little bit more more personalized, creative follow-up, and, and and go for an advance. Um, you may not be able to go, you're, you're not gonna be able to go for the tour necessarily, uh, the traditional tour or the, you know, asking them to come in, but you can, you know, you can, you can ask for a lot of other small steps that will keep that person engaged in the sales process, that prospect. Um, and so, so best performers spend, based on other studies that we've done in the past, spend about 10% or sometimes even 15% of their time in personalized, highly personalized creative follow-up, and also almost 30% of their time in planning planning for, with individual prospects, for individual prospects, with the team, or sometimes, unfortunately, by yourself. But again, it's that preparation. And we are still not at those levels of best performers, even pre-COVID. So perhaps let's break away a little bit from all those emails and trying to spread ourselves so wide across our, our entire leads to touch base with everyone and really focusing a little a little more in a smaller group of people that we can go deeper with. This mm -hmm. is this is is going to really um, I believe help us be prepared for um, a bunch of people in our lead base ready to say yes once we can open everything up again. And and so finally, uh, what kinds of outcomes are we seeing? Um, uh, certainly, again, moving is not, not at the levels that we want, but we are seeing outcomes in terms of advances. We're generating more advances, and we are, of those, 
um, the Trust Breakthrough Advance, which is a sort of a very Sherpa thing, but it's really an indication that after you made that call, you basically gained information that was meaningful to the prospect, that's meaningful to you to understand what your strategy needs to be. In other words, some motivation, some objection, something that they weren't disclosing to you before and now they've opened up and have, and now you have a much better idea of what the next step should be. So trust breakthroughs are, are essential. In, in terms of guiding a person through the decision-making process. And then again, the permission to maybe I'll have you, you know, maybe it might be interested for you if a resident with your like interest gives you a call, would you be willing to talk to that person or the adult child of a person that had a similar situation? And so there's tons of things that you could do when the tour is not an option. And that's mm -hmm. the opportunity. Um, finally, and I'm almost not taking even a breath um, there is sales and deposits we see kind of we don't see an uptick of we're getting more deposits than we did before um, but we still that's still a, a very good close obviously um, people can still make a decision a commitment choose a unit with a flexible moving date they don't have to know when to move in but sometimes many times for a prospective buyer and their family, being able to have made the decision that they will do it as soon as it's convenient and put down a commitment for that is really kind of a huge burden off their shoulders. So we need to feel confident that we can still ask for the check, we can still ask for the commitment, we can suggest it as a, a great next step to when everything is ready to go back to normal or the new normal, um, that decision's already made. Um, so uh, that's kind of it. Um, the one thing that I noticed the most is again in, in March, no, sorry, in, in April, we just went back to our lead bases, to our old leads, to our cold leads and called them to death. We just called everybody. <laughs> yes, the volume of leads worked was higher than in April than all of 2019 average, monthly average. So that the monthly average of 2019, meaning that certainly we took a deep dive and communicated with everyone. Perhaps we sent a bunch of emails about our protocols and I understand that, um, but because we're spending less time and we're spreading that time across more people, there's a huge dilution of, of effectiveness. So. Uh, you've got, everybody's got quite a few, with exceptions, everybody has enough leads to do sales work. Um, yes, it's always nice to have new inquiries, and I think that's going to come back, but um, there's there's plenty there for us to work more effectively. Yeah, so really digging into the, the existing lead base and planning and being, you know, highly personal in your follow-up. Uh, it's interesting, some of the things that you said, um, you know, how shallow the uh, initial discovery is with new leads. You know, we find all the time, um, because, you know, we spend probably more time on the marketing side. And like with Sherpa, we have a, a nice bilateral integration with HubSpot. So we're able to look at all of the things that the prospect is is doing from a marketing perspective. And then we're able to go into Sherpa and we're able to follow that lead and see what the behavior is of the sales team. Right. And what's remarkable is, um, you know, we'll have a prospect that's been on the website six times and they finally work up the courage to download that brochure or schedule that tour or ask for a call back or whatever that, that behavior is that converts them, right? And we can see the pages they visited, we can see the blogs that they're reading, like it's amazing the information that you have. And right. then, you know, we we hand this lead, that's this precious lead, <laughs> you know, come in through a paid ad or from organic and we see that they're highly engaged and we give it to the sales team and it goes into Sherpa and there are literally an average of two attempts. I know, two. I know, I know. And then they move, they move them to Lost. I know. And and but what's interesting is because we're still able, you know, through HubSpot to track their behavior, 
weeks after they've been moved to lost and just let go by the sales team, usually unable to reach is the Mm -hmm. the, uh, the death of all leads. <laughs> you know, we're able to see that they've come back four more times to the website and they've had all these behaviors. So while the salesperson has written them off because of their two attempts and moved them to and now it's over. Now they're not even they're not even cold. They're gone. Um, and yet we're still seeing this continued interest. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping that at least through this with fewer leads that, first of all, the leads that they're getting, they'll take more seriously. You know, because they don't have so many to work, uh, I think we have to shift, shift the mindset, which especially when those lead sources were coming in from the website, I think there's pr probably a predisposition to say, oh, it's a website lead. And somehow that gets diminished in its value. So if it had been a call in or if they come to an event, you know, perhaps they wouldn't make two outbound attempts and move them to loss. But somehow because it's identified as a web lead, you know, they can't yeah. wait. To, it's almost like they want to disqualify them. How quickly can I disqualify them and move them to loss? Yeah. Um, so what do you think? So true. Yeah, I'm, and I'm sure you see the same thing. So yeah. Yeah. what I'd love to know from your perspective is um, a couple of things. One is, are the sales team taking the new leads any more seriously than before? Or, or are they still just doing a very cursory um, glance and it really hasn't changed behavior? And is the are the leads that we're getting more, um, you know, more motivated? Uh, do they have more urgency? Um, so we might be working fewer leads, but we have certainly an opportunity for higher conversions because let's face it, we were pretty much selling a product that nobody plans for. And most people don't want, they might need it, but they don't want it. They think they can't afford it. And now there's a pandemic and yet the leads are still coming in. So, yeah. <laughs> so people still need what we offer. Um, and so what, what are your thoughts? Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, around now more than ever. Yeah. You know, yes, yes, yes. And yes, uh, we had, uh, when, from my, when I first started and, I worked um, at the Gatesworth and David Smith taught me everything. And what he said is that nobody, regardless of whether you do it via web or you make a call, and now web is easier, but that what it takes for a human being to actually reach out to a senior living community um, to ask about our units or our pricing, we have to really get to understand what has to happen in somebody's life, in, the, in that family's life, for that step to be taken. Um, lots of, it's like the, the, the tip of the iceberg is the inquiry and the level of interest may be certainly always uh, under, under represented by the buyer there. Oh, we're just looking around or we're just, we're just asking around or we're doing our research. Um, but if we really understand, as David said, it's every call, every inquiry is a 911 call. And I'm not talking there about physical urgency, but it is uh, certainly something in the life of the prospective resident is not working anymore. And otherwise they wouldn't have just casually, they're not inquiring on the web because it's easier or because they're less interested. Um, it is just now, um, you know, in the 20 years I've been in the industry, uh, you know, web wasn't really a thing before mm -hmm. at the beginning. So there was a lot of direct mail call-ins, you know, forms, et cetera. Um, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it matters, but it really doesn't matter. I don't care what the lead source is. I mean, certainly if it comes from a professional referral source, there would be a different kind of interaction. And we know that those have very high conversions. If it's coming from a, um, a resident referral, we know that they have very high conversions and there's a different dynamic there. Uh, but, and we know them better because we have the discovery from the resident that referred. We already have a framework of understanding uh, from, from the person that referred, like a professional or a uh, professional referral or a family member or a resident. So those, that's why those are very high conversions because we tend to know more and we tend to already have enough there to, you know, to work them. The other sources, as you say, you know, two attempts uh, and then that's it. And then we give up two things. One, it could be just the sheer volume. I mean, because 
I, I do, I am sensitive to, uh, and having been in the trenches for so long, too many leads coming in are so distracting. And we are trying to get through them quickly because we need to respond, we're told to respond quickly, but we can't handle the volume because we only have so much time. And then they're here telling us, spend time planning and do your journaling and really dig deep. And then I have like three leads sitting on deck that are new, and then I know that so and so, so, so we have to understand, and here's one of my focus focuses for these next few months is the, 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 the life of a leasing counselor, of a sales professional in our industry. What is it that they're thinking, feeling? How are they managing their time? So one thing is that the volume sometimes, usually from website or lead aggregators, is so high that humanly we just try to get through them because mm -hmm. we're told to respond quickly um so that's the pro that's one of the problems and and this idea that we need to every time we get a lead regardless of the source we need to give them the time and attention they deserve i mean it's noble and it is absolutely important but it is just not feasible for sitting in the salesperson's uh seat uh, to actually do that with the time that you have. You can spend about four hours in the selling zone a day. We have data that proves that, um, and we track that. Uh, everything else is just your life, your other stuff at work, you know, some marketing things, some operational stuff, whatever. But you can dedicate four hours in the selling zone um, a day. That's not a lot of time. And really focus time, that's about what best performers do sometimes five, but you have to be nuts. You, yeah. You're really good. I mean, really sort of strong. Uh, but that's that's it. And so now imagine that you have, this is your day. You have, under normal circumstance, maybe a tour coming in. You've scheduled a home visit. You have your top 10. You're going to do some planning for next steps with people that you advanced yesterday, and you want to you know, just keep them going, keep the momentum going. So you're doing all that, and so all of a sudden, when you do your planning session, you realize, okay, Mrs. Jones, we had an advance yesterday with a daughter, so today we're going to do this, and we're going to do this follow-up, and we're going to keep them going. But at the same time, bing, 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 we're getting like three, four new leads. It's like, okay, so do we give up on Mrs. Jones's uh, planning and the strategy, or do we? what do we do? And what we do... Uh, is react, react to the new lead quickly, try to get through it because we also to are told that we need to do those home visits and we need to do that creative follow-up. It's just not humanly possible. Mm -hmm. So if we take a really good look at our sales resources, which is salespeople's time, that's our sales resource. We can add more salespeople. We can ask them to work more than humanly possible. Uh, if we're going to give them so many leads, we need to make sure that we have enough time to cook them, to process them, not not to say cook them because that's not nice, but, you know, to process them, to to do the in-depth discovery and to guide them through the decision. So having said all that, yes, it is important that every new lead is gold, uh, that we focus and sometimes that's going to be at the detriment of your entire lead base. If you take 10, 20 people on a daily basis and you rotate them as you go, but you really focus, your conversions are going to be much higher than if you try to process a huge sort of wide um, birth of people because your engagement will be shallow and your conversions will suffer from that. So how does this yeah how does this new uh this new reality and uh kind of how we've pivoted i mean we can't fall back on uh you know come for a tour come for lunch come for a visit come for a, an event um how do we have to shift uh sales training um mm -hmm. and maybe even the type of of salesperson uh that we're hiring do we, are we looking for a kind of a different skill set and then how do we have to support them differently with training to create different behaviors yeah, that's, those are great questions. I believe, yes, I, and I believe this for a long time, even pre-COVID, that we need to, because of the incredible demands on, on salespeople, 
we need to have a different kind of training, a different kind of approach. Number one, um, this over-reliance on the product. So we're hiring people and I love salespeople, I'm one of them. So, but mostly we're looking for somebody that knows the industry, that has had experience, and that's really good at giving tours and just really good with people, you know, and that can close. And those things are great and they're important. Uh, but uh, we are, in many cases, we have a ton of tour givers, glorified tour givers, and we have, we have, we have. And we, we need to refocus uh, our training and our strategies in sales to flipping it. We're actually going to run a campaign called Flip It. Uh, okay. we flip it to the prospect. So we have the, the camera on the product. Now let's flip the camera on the prospect. And that sounds easy enough to do, but it requires a whole different set of skills. Uh, understanding that, and these are the skills, and that's another thing that I'm very passionate about, and I'm creating a profile of a great leasing counselor. We need emotional intelligence, and everybody talks about it, but what does that mean in our industry? We need a ton of self-awareness that it's not me, it's not that they're going to like me or my community, this, I am here as a facilitator of change, as somebody that can draw from the prospect their um, motivations, their objections, their fears, so that they can solve inside of their own heads their, their emotional barriers to change. These people will change. They wouldn't have called otherwise. So we need to try to facilitate that versus uh, shortcut that process with offering the tour too soon as our only thing because that detracts 90% of the leads that really are not ready to buy yet, but they need it. So that's number one. So emotional intelligence, self-awareness, uh, meaning like I am feeling vulnerable right now. I, you know, I want to go back to the product right, right away because that's where I feel safe. I am uncomfortable talking to strangers. I am uncomfortable uh, it makes me feel funny to ask about somebody's life story right now. What will they think about me? So overcome some of these things, being able to self-regulate that and say, no, this is my job. My job is to sort of be, um, overcome that fear of vulnerability and be courageous and just say, I'm showing up. Doesn't matter, letting go of the outcome. Very hard to do for traditional salespeople. Then we need drive, motivation and drive. And motivation is, um, I, I want every salesperson that gets hired to um, write a statement of intention. Why are you doing this? What is it that you're hoping to accomplish? And how would you explain to your prospect what your role is? What is your role? And so uh, just a simple writing the statement, your statement of purpose. What if you had to describe not to me, not to your friends, but to the prospect, what your role is? What is your job? You should be able to say that to your prospects, to your new inquiries, to everybody all day long. No, I'm here. I'm the marketer. No, I'm Alex. This is my role. This is what I'm hoping to help you with, uh, regardless of whether you move here or not. So that's really primarily important. That's a huge part of that intrinsic motivation that comes with emotional intelligence. Empathy is super important, of course. And we all talk about empathy, but we confuse it with sympathy a lot. There's three different kinds, emotional, cognitive, and empathic concern. So we can actually hire for, um, for that kind of empathy that says, I don't really, I don't know how you feel, but I can, based on what you're telling me, I can imagine it. I can internalize it and I can empathize. And then together, together, you're not alone in this. Um, so. You know, those are all great combinations and not everybody has the same. You can have an emotional quotient and you may be high in, in, in empathy, like you really feel for people right away and it's, it's this high emotional empathy, but yet you have no drive or you get stuck or you're not so self-aware that this is affecting you and it's affecting the way that you're managing your sales process. So it's fascinating. Let's hire people that perhaps have some background 
in understand the psychology of people that have we offer training on on behaviors on who the prospect is and what they're really looking for um, yes they need to be knowledgeable about the building and the industry of course um, but most people can do that not very many people can do that first stage of opening somebody up and and also building that that trust and connection because really ultimately our prospects are deciding what to do with the rest of their lives and they're deciding whether you salesperson represents uh, the kind of place I want to live for the rest of my life are you the kind of person that I want to be around for the rest of my life do you care about me so ultimately that's what they're buying they're buying this sense of I'm home here and you make me feel like home. And for that, we need to really uh, look for skills that relate to emotional intelligence, self-awareness, and incredible amount of grit and determination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even more so now. Um, so yeah. you know, that was all of those things that you described, the kind of the resistance to change, um, you know, the emotion um, of making these decisions. And now you add on top of that fear. Yes, <laughs> so. on both the part of the seller and the buyer. So we are, we salespeople are very scared. They're, we're scared about um, nobody's going to want our product anymore. Uh, I can't really do my tours and if people can, or what if they ask me if we have a COVID case and we do, or someone has died from COVID here, what am I doing talking to this prospect? Yeah. What if they ask me? So there's there's fear of that and, and sort of a lack of confidence in what we're selling. And then, of course, the, the prospect has fears as well of like, what if I don't want to move in because if I move in, my family couldn't visit or I may get infected, et cetera. But, but I, I, I look at these two opportunities. There's, there's it's like a double-edged sword with COVID. From the prospect's perspective, prospect buying circle, family members and prospective resident, there's, there's an increased uh, level of resistance that to the resistance that's always been there uh, from emotional resistance to senior housing. Um, but there's also an increased in motivation. And those are the two things that we as salespeople need to talk to our prospects about to put them in context. So yeah it may be that i'm much i'm very scared about moving in and and having all these issues and potentially getting sick but at the same time i am highly motivated because my current situation because of covid has gotten so much worse um so much worse than it used to be i was already isolated i was already kind of cut off but now it's worse for all these reasons and the problems that i used to have that we sometimes don't even care about those motivation motivations to actually picking up the phone I have gotten amplified so we have here and we're seeing that we're seeing you asked about new inquiries are they more motivated I I, I don't know necessarily and and I'm looking at actually measuring time spent with the new inquiry versus the old inquiry and that's mm -hmm. for the next iteration that yeah. we may have before this airs but uh, so I don't know if we're spending more or less time with new inquiries than before, and I'll get that information because it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I do know that um, I totally lost my track. <laughs> I, I totally lost the track of what I'm saying. Sorry. Oh God, I hate when that happens. That's um, all right. So that that increase in motivation. I don't know if they're more motivated. Um, I think. Another thing that we found, this is where I was going, uh, that the people that we're converting now have a, an actual longer sales cycle than the average. So that I found pretty interesting, that there's a slight uptick on days in the lead base to move in. So what this means is that the people that we're converting are not necessarily, although there are those that are the new inquiry that inquired in that month, and that's, that's pretty high because they are highly motivated, especially in memory care. We see a sure. huge, very motivated there, obviously, for obvious reasons. Um, but there is, um, I think, a lot of the people that were in our lead base uh, whose situation has gotten much worse because of COVID are stepping up and coming in. 
And that kind of takes us to virtual tours where we find that we only have about a little rough over 7,000 to measure with their outcomes. And that's, that's, that's pretty, that's significant enough for us to want it. We wanted to see, are we converting virtual tours? We don't really, haven't defined what it is and we're going to do a right. lot of work. But let's assume yeah. that what we call a virtual tour is I'm on, on an, a video app or Zoom or, and I am interacting with the actual prospect on the other side and we're talking, and we're doing some discovery and we're showing around and we're flipping it and actually mm -hmm. have them show us some of their environment as well. We find that we have 20 plus percent in memory care, 28 percent conversion of a virtual tour to a either a sale, a deposit, a sale or a move in. That's pretty high. It um, is. But of those, that 28 percent comes from people that ha already had visited your community. So in other words, it's a reinforcement. It's like, yeah, I visited three months ago. Now things are much worse. Show us the room. Let's do the paperwork. Uh, let's figure out how we can get mom moved in. That's right. what I theorize is happening. Yeah. Uh, when, but people are also at about six percent blend uh, converting without a prior visit. And I believe those. My theory is, and again, I don't know that those are pretty urgent people that say, I, you know, we just have to do this sight unseen. So there is a slight, so they're worth doing and they're really worth uh, for us, you know, getting really good at it. Do you know, Dev, how yes. long it takes to give a good tour, <laughs> a good real <laughs> tour? Well, gosh, when I was giving tours, I would always tell people, let's plan on staying for an hour. I really, I need to get to know you, your situation, how I can help. You're probably going to want to meet members of the team and sit and chat with some residents. I mean, to do it right, um, I really do feel like it takes, I, I think everything takes longer than most people are doing it. So when I listen to mystery shops, you know, it, it seems like the salesperson can't wait to get name, address, phone, zip, how did you hear about us? And can I qualify you or disqualify you? And I'm going to ask you for a tour within the first two minutes. And it's, and it's quick. I mean, I, I, the mystery shops I listen to are, you know, probably an average of five to seven minutes. And I'm like, oh, but we don't know anything about them. No, um, and then, you know, the tours also, I, you know, I find that, uh, you know, people are so committed to their tour route or hitting their talking points. They're really not spending the time developing the relationship, which at the end of the day, and, and even more so now, and, and I'd love to kind of pivot this to, you know, we're no longer selling, you know, necessarily the real estate, the lifestyle, our all day dining program, our out trips, like all of those kinds of talking points. So, you know, before we hit the record button, we were just kind of getting into a really good conversation about new messaging and how we're going to, we spent a lot of time talking about nurturing the existing lead base who already you maybe have more of a relationship with, but we're pretty soon gonna have to get into new lead generation. Um, so what's the messaging? What's the level of transparency? And how do we now uh, connect with prospects maybe a little bit differently? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that. I, um, I always believe that um, selling the product was really um, not the best strategy, even in, in, in normal times. And um, there is, I believe, overall or i sensed in my experience that we were selling something that we didn't really want to use um there, there's this uh, there's a little bit of a mistrust or gosh i don't even know how to put it but you know it, it's almost like emotionally for for most of us the idea of in the future i'm looking forward to moving to one of the communities i work with yeah, I mean, I think that's more and more the case now, but it didn't used to be. I mean, it's almost like it's 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 this distance. It's like this is for people that are old and sick, and yeah, we're so nice, and we're going to help them, and we're going to care for them. I always believe that we are we need to become a caring about people industry, not a caring for people industry. 
because we need to care about the needs, the wants, the desires of our residents. And that's how we're going to build um, this the culture within our residences uh, that, that really fulfill the promise of the industry, which is mm -hmm. to provide a congregate housing or a set of, of, of residences within a community in which people can thrive, can truly thrive you know, with support, the support they need so that they can fulfill uh, the aspirations that they have for their life, learn new things, all of these things um, that are so important. And by us focusing on that quick, you know, I got my route, I got my I got my pre-recorded tape, oh, so you're assisted, I'm gonna tell you all about assisted. Are you independent? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you all about the chef. Um, this sort of canned, you know, and oh, this person doesn't need it anymore, therefore we're going to leave them alone. They don't have the physical urgency, then we're going to leave them alone. We have created the problem. Uh, this approach has, I believe, sort of hurt us because we're getting the higher acuity people through our selling, uh, mm -hmm. selling the canned product for those people that need it, focusing on the urgent ones. Um, and then that hurts the sort of the ethos of our communities. Mm -hmm. So now the new message to me, first of all, transparency, certainly. Um, we have all these glossy sort of idealized image of old people and many of our advertising and our websites are, you know, these people playing golf and all that. And that's fine. And I'd love for everybody to play golf. And, and that's real. And that's I'm not saying that we need to present a dire, you know, but there is a there is a an opportunity for us to be a little bit more authentic. Uh, I think in our messaging, um, we need to be more confident in our product, both from the marketing side to like this stuff is really good. It transforms lives. It really does. I'm an adult child. My mom currently lives in an independent living community. I haven't seen her for three months, but she's so happy. I'm so happy that she is where she is. And I can't even, and yes, of course, there's a couple of people that had COVID in the building, but I'm not worried. And she's not worried because she's got everything that she needs. So, so this really think about the benefits of our product to, for yourself. And if we really put ourselves in the shoes of, of the people that inquire from us, understand that what we're offering is priceless, priceless for them, both in terms of all of the incredible benefits that we already know about and all the intangible ones that we are not necessarily aware of. So double down our confidence in our product. You know, don't let COVID, you know, put us down or, or lose fear or confidence in what we're offering. Um, so from from and then also be very real. I know salespeople are worried about, you know, when worried about or afraid if somebody's going to ask them, if someone has COVID in your building. Um, I was we, we were doing a, a podcast with Lacey Youngman from um, Heritage, uh, and and she was it was great, really great because she was talking about uh, you know this how how real they are even in their virtual tours is like. Here's our people with masks, and this is what's going on. And yeah, the dining room is empty. I'll show you. It's it's empty now because we're practicing social distancing and we're delivering. But this radical, radical vulnerability is what I think our ultimately our customer will appreciate. If we mm -hmm. try to cross it over or find an angle that is not necessarily the truth or or the unvarnished truth then I think it'll hurt us in the in the long run. So are you optimistic that we will um, maybe make some uh, pivots and we will somehow experiment and transform the way that we market and sell and interact with prospects through this experience? I am so optimistic. I am so hopeful. I think this is going to really help us transform all those things and better serve our prospective customers. I, you know, certainly I do feel very, uh, for, for communities that whose operating costs have gone down and the occupancy issues have created true 
um, you know, fall, drops under 80% occupancy, and this this is sad. And even some communities that, you know, may have to default because of this, and that just breaks my heart. Um, so I am aware of the operationally of the difficulties um, that our industry will experience adjusting to the new protocols and et cetera. However, I also I also think that in this better approach, more authentic um, to our prospective customers, we will create higher occupancies, fuller buildings with people that have less urgency, but are really, um, we really can get them ready, getting ready to, to say yes, because of our confidence, our transparency, our love, our love for what we do and how we do it. So we are going to get better. I'm sure of it. That's great. Well, I so appreciate you sharing your senior living marketing perspectives with us. And if people want to get a hold of you, learn more about uh, Sherpa and download the report, what's the best way uh, for them to get all that information? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so let's see. Um, I am Alex at SherpaCRM.com or Ask Alex or LinkedIn, Sherpa page. We are all over it so please you know feel free to reach out to me directly uh the report uh, sherpacrm.com is is our website and if you go to the blog you'll see uh, a blog post and a link to download to download the report um so yeah that's widely available for everybody it's totally free i guess we are asking you to put your email in sorry you know how that goes. That's the currency <laughs> of the web. <laughs> That's the way it right. is. You can opt out. We won't bother you. Um, hopefully, yeah. and if you do, let us know. But yeah, so that's all available. And we will be creating some um, report updates in the coming weeks um, with some further insights. So we're really excited to uh, continue to guide the industry through this and us and the industry guiding us. I mean, we're all guiding each other. And I really appreciate, Debbie, your um, this initiative that you've taken, uh, as always, you know, to try to educate and to impart knowledge and share knowledge with the industry that we love so much. So thanks. Yeah. We all love it. That's why we're that's why we're in it. <laughs> yep. Well, we will we will have all your information in the show notes. Thank you so much for your time and, and for sharing your knowledge. And I'll look forward to the next reports. Sounds great. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much. Take care, Alex. Take care.